Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see all of you here today. Glad to have those of you back who have been on vacation for what seems like forever. Must be nice. Uh, but no, it's good to have everybody here. Beautiful day today. God has blessed us beyond measure. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us together, for keeping us safe and sound when we're apart, and for giving us the strength to get through each and every day. We just ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to what your word has to teach us this morning, Lord. And as we lift up our songs of praise, may you accept our worship and be blessed by our voices. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A prayer request for Chris and Cloy for protection from a COVID exposure and an update on that. Cloy now has a temperature and is coughing. So he's going to go get a test today. Healing for days of my friend Dick, who has his second hospitalization for COVID. For my sister Jeanette and her husband Roger, who think they caught COVID at the concert that we went to. I've been on here. Evan's birthday, I thought it was October. It's November 4th. That's our compassion kit. So if you want to write a letter and bring it to church, we'll send them to him. Uh, safe travel for Deb's family as they travel home for a visit. She'll have seven in her household that she's eating and taking care of. Uh, prayers to get Tabitha's meds regulated. Prayers for Todd's mom, Maggie, who's going to the doctor, has not been to the doctor for the final update and scheduling, but she's going to have to have one or two valve replacements. And I just put prayers for our country. You can pray all day on that one. Anything else? One announcement. It's right here on the bottom. They'll see it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, one announcement. We have set the date for next year's Corn Festival. It will be July 21st, 2nd, and 23rd. Uh, 21st being, of course, family night. We have not, we have not set the uh, entertainment yet, but mark your calendars July 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of next year for Corn Fest. Heavenly Father, we lift all of these prayers up to you. You know what each one of us needs, but you like to hear it from us. You like us to know what our needs are beyond our care, beyond what we can do. Lord, we lift these up to you. We lift up all that we are to you. Not just our needs, but our praise and our thanksgiving as well, Lord. For answered prayers and just for your presence in our lives, Lord. We ask you to look carefully over and be with Evans as he celebrates his birthday coming up, Tabitha, my mom, Deb and her family uh, as they gather together, Lord, Chris and Cloy as they deal with this potential COVID situation, uh, Lord, and just everybody who is dealing with whatever it is they may be but especially our, our illnesses and our, and our misfortunes, Lord. We, we pour ourselves out to you for guidance, for discipline, and just for you to lift us up when we can't lift ourselves up anymore. Lord, we lift our nation up to you, a nation that is missing you. We've turned our back on you, Lord, and, and we need to come back to you. We need to hold on to you and, and embrace you in all that you are if we are going to, to restore this nation to the great nation that it once was. Lord, we just lift it up to you, including our, our military and those who protect us here at home, our leaders from our president all the way down to our, our civic leaders in our own communities, Lord, and all of our church leaders, that we will be filled with your Holy Spirit 
and bring to your communities and to this nation your grace, your blessing, and your love. We lift these all, all of this up to you in the name of our Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning again. Good morning to those of you joining us line as well. Uh, it's good to have everybody here on uh, this beautiful day. As we continue our, our uh, study of the book of Philippians. We are in, uh, we'll be in Philippians chapter 2 today. United in Christ. And I'd like to start it out with a story about stolen joy. A while back, a friend of mine experienced um, a gut punch. Came home one day from work, and his wife told me she wanted a divorce. You know, most of us have had our joy stolen from us at some point. Maybe not as deep as that one was. Some of us have experienced that. And it's not a good time. And all too often, what happens is we sit there and we, we wallow in that misery of the situation. And we feel like we can't go anywhere or get out or do anything. And you know, for those people who, who don't have a faith in Jesus, I can understand that. Because there's no real future hope to look forward to like we have with Jesus. But as Christians, we have a different situation, a different opportunity. But yet we still fall into that woe is me kind of mentality. But we have something to look forward to. That future, that hope of eternal life in heaven with, with Jesus and with God. And while that doesn't necessarily take away the immediate pain of a situation, the thought that this will go on and I have something so much better to look forward to should help you from staying stuck in that pit, in that hole where that pain is. My friend fumbled around for a few weeks, uh, saw him quite a few times during that period and then the day of the divorce came, and he woke up that morning and realized that although he didn't want this to end, it is what it is. And God has something better in store for him in the next season of his life. And he's moved on. He's accepted what it what is what's happened, and he's decided that I've got so many better opportunities because of my faith, I don't need to worry about it. And that's the kind of thing that having that, that faith in Christ and being one with Christ should bring for each of us. From the book of Philippians, chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having that same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. What's the easiest and quickest way to break the hearts and the will of the people, of a group of people? A question that's been asked for centuries by leaders of every nation and even leaders of those who are not part of the kingdom. And the easiest way to do that is to separate them. There's a reason the United States has this as one of its models. United we stand. Because when we're together, as Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, a three-stranded cord is stronger than one. We are much stronger together than we are when we're separate. And to be honest with you, there is no better example than the church about separating people. Don't get me wrong, what Martin Luther did had to be done. And there are good biblical and theological reasons for changing congregations, for even a church to leave the denomination that it's in. The unfortunate reality is that too many people don't use those reasons. And the ones they do are not biblical. They get upset because somebody decides to change the color of the carpet. Or change the lights in the sanctuary. I mean, silly things. Or they don't like the fact that the preacher is 20 years younger than them. And seems to preach more to the to the younger crowd than, they, than he does the older crowd. Oops. You know, there's and there's there's ways to do this. There's really two ways that this happens the most often. One is false teaching from outside, and that's people coming in and teaching the word contrary to what the Bible actually says or doing it for something other than for Jesus and for God. The other is disagreements with it. But regardless of how it begins, it just kind of grows and festers because people are unwilling to listen to each other. Refusing to listen to the truth of God's word 
or just simply unwilling to accept the rebuke of a congregation or even a congregation unwilling to rebuke that individual to come at them and say, hey, we as a group believe you to be wrong and this is why. This is what scripture says. It's a lack of communication and more often a refusal to communicate with each other because we don't want to rock the boat or we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. See, there's a difference between unity and uniformity. Jesus came to bring unity to the people. Unity is something that comes from a, within. A willingness to work together towards a common goal. And it's the result of that love and grace that Jesus brought and told us to teach and take to the people. It's a willingness to listen to one another, to talk with each other, to discuss our differences, and come to a conclusion that we can both accept. Uniformity, on the other hand, is the result of pressure from the outside. Somebody trying to force you into doing something you don't want to do. And it comes out of pride and selfishness because they think that what they've got is the right thing. And they try and force it on you. It's hard to find joy when you're being forced to do something. And I haven't met too many people who are in the position of power who are truly happy themselves because of what or how they handle things. So last week, we talked about how Christ overall was to be our mindset. And we are to be one with him. And when we do that, when we have the mind, mind of Christ, we see that God works for us, he works in us, and he works through us. Well, this week, we're going to take that one step further and putting that Christ, that single-mindedness with Christ into action. To do that, we have to ask, ask well, where was Christ mind? What was, what was Christ, what was Jesus thinking about during his ministry? Well, first and foremost, it was on the Father's work. He came down here to do dear old dad's work for him. Dad sent him with a job and said, this is what I want you to do. As part of that, he had to focus on the needs of others, not himself. Jesus didn't think about himself. Paul wrote it in the letter. Yes, he knew that he was God, but he didn't consider that part of what he was and that he was as good as God. And he humbled himself and brought himself to earth and put himself underneath us. Humility often seen as a, a character flaw, really isn't. It's really a character strength. Because you put oneself under, you put yourself under another. Not in a position of submission, but in a position of lifting up. Of providing for them and helping them to stand on their own feet. Jesus didn't think any less of himself, but he did make himself lower than human beings. He knew who he was. He knew what he had in the Holy Spirit 
and as and as as the son of God. But he let go of that position and became our servant to show us how we are to be God's children. The single-minded Christian will yield themselves to be to be that Christ, to be Christ, to be a servant to somebody else. Using what you are given, one, for the good of the individual, of that, of the person or people, but more so for the glory of God. It's not about ourselves. It's not about what we get out of it. It's about what God gets out of it. Humility is not being at somebody's beck and call or being a, a welcome mat for somebody to walk over all the time. But it's about, it's about showing the glory and grace and discipline of our Lord. It's saying, I know what I have. And I need for you, I need to bring you up to this. So I'm going to bring myself down below you to lift you up. Jesus had a mindset of others first. Um, I don't know who said this. Um, where I got it from didn't even admit it. He didn't know where it came from. But outlook determines outcome. So what you're looking, what you're trying to achieve determines how you're going to get there. And whether or not you can. So you have to ask yourself, where am I going? Where are we going? And how are we, what are we going to try to do to accomplish that? And for whom are we doing this? Are we doing it for me or am I doing it for God? Am I doing it for somebody else? Jesus sought unity under the Father, not himself. It wasn't about Jesus. Now, when you do things, and if you do them often enough, you will get recognition. People will see that. They may tip off the media, and they'll come after you, and want to interview you, and find out why you're doing these things, and what's going on. The recognition isn't the problem, it's what you do with it. You know, Jesus, through most of his ministry, tried to conceal who he really was. When somebody, when he would heal somebody, he would say, don't tell them who did, who did this, but take your sacrifice to the temple and offer it to the Pharisees as thanksgiving, as a thanksgiving offering to God for your healing. All he did was go about doing what the Father, what his Father told him to do. He was a, a great leader, a great teacher. And great leaders use their position, their advantages, their skills to help build what they're working on. Not for their own glory or their own recognition. The general in Civil War, George McClellan, was a great general for the North, lots of victories. Unfortunately, over the course of his career, he was recognized by President Lincoln and the, the uh, others in power because he was abusing his, his, his rank as a general. So they went to talk to him about it. They got to his house, knocked on the door. His uh, butler answered. And he said, well, I'm sorry, he's not here. He went to so-and-so's wedding. President Lincoln said, that's okay. We'll just wait for him over here in the city. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. 
Finally, General McClellan stumbled into his house, went upstairs, and went straight to bed. His servant went to him and said, Sir, the president's here to see you. And the general told him, Okay. And went to sleep. The servant went down and told the president that he acknowledged that he was there. Another two hours went by. It, president Lincoln called on the servant again and said, hey, can you go get him and bring him down here? So he went back upstairs, woke up the general, and the general said, no, I will see him in the morning. Here you go, you've got the president of the United States in your sitting room, and you say, no, I'll see him in the morning. Your boss, <laughs> as it were. So the, the butler went downstairs and said to the president, Mr. President, I'm sorry, but he said he'll see you in the morning. He's sleeping right now. Mr. Lincoln sat there for a little bit, grabbed his hat, his coat, and walked out the front door. The men that were with him clambered behind him and said, Mr. President, aren't you going to do something? He said, yes, I'm going to come see the general in the morning when he's awake. Two lessons from this story about how we treat people. And even, even scripture, there's over 20 times in the New Testament that God instructs us on how to live with one another. Romans 2, chapter 10 says, or excuse me, 12, chapter 12, verse 10 says we are to prefer one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, we are to lift each other up. Galatians 6, 2, bear each other's burdens. Again in Romans 14, 13, we are not to judge. And in 15, 14, admonish each other. You see, when we put others first, as Jesus did, we serve them. We pour out ourselves for their benefit, to lift them up, to help carry them through their troubles. And not in a way of showing off our superiority, not saying, I'm better than you, but saying, I'm here with you to get you through this. I'm here with you to lend you a hand. Putting yourself in their shoes and walking with them. A willingness to do what is necessary so that they can experience the grace of God. Oftentimes, it will call us to be sacrificial. To sacrifice something in our lives. There may be a personal cost involved. But that doesn't matter. It's a willingness to lay down your life for their benefit. A pastor once said, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. If you aren't willing to pay the price to get it done, you're going to get nothing back. Another pastor once said, for blessing, there must be some kind of bleeding. You've got to bust our knuckles on occasion. Get dirty. The test of a submissive mind, being one with Christ, is not about how much suffering you can handle, but how much service you are willing to give. And the third thing about putting others first is giving credit where credit is due. What we are doing, the church, is not about you 
in me. It's not about you versus me. It's not about us versus some other church or some other faith. It's about us and non-Christians. It's about us and them. And it makes no difference what we as a church do if we don't first glorify God. And that's what Paul was calling on the Philippians to do, was whatever you do, do it in a manner that puts God at the forefront so that they know that God was the one for this. In verse 12, he said, to work out your salvation. Now, as Christians, we are lights in the darkness of this world. That's what verse that's what Matthew 5, 16 was about. Go out into the world and shine so that other people can see God through you. We are to be that light when they're in utter blackness. And the energy for that light is supplied through the work of God. Science lesson for you. You guys remember science class? Way back when? Long time for all of us. Well, <laughs> that one kind of died on me. I blew it up beforehand. But, anyway, remember what potential energy is? Potential energy. Potential energy is what is in this balloon right now. It has the potential to do work. Potential energy. Energy of a body with respect to its position. Right now, doesn't look too much. So I just proved pastors are full of hot air. <laughs> but now we've got this balloon. It's stretched. It's pushing against the air that's inside. It has potential to do something. When we change that over to kinetic energy, energy of a body with respect to motion, It moves, it squeezes, it goes away from you. Our Christian lives are like that balloon. We're filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit, stretched to our limits with potential. But until we blow that spirit out, until we push that spirit out of us and move and go from where we're at, it doesn't matter. That's what it is to work out your salvation. It's not about working to do good, but it's about going out and doing the direction of the Holy Spirit. Doing what Jesus told us to do. Go forth and teach what I have taught you. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not working for your salvation. Which is a man good and plan. But working out your salvation is allowing God to work in and through you for the benefit of others and for his glory. And for this to happen, he has to work in us in order to get work out of us. I had to blow that balloon up in order to get the work out. 
You know, I look back at my life and I see similarities to many Old Testament uh, characters. Uh, because God had to do things to me to get me to this position, to get me into the ministry. It took 80 years for God to prepare Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. It took him, I don't know, 15 or so years to prepare David. When, 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 um, oh my gosh, the prophet's name, Samuel, uh, first went to Jesse. David was only 12 years old, maybe 15. When, Jesse, when Samuel anointed him king over Israel. But it took another 15 to 20 years or so for him to grow into that leadership to be the leader that God wanted him to be. And that's because God is more interested in the worker, excuse me, more, yes, God is more interested in the worker than he is the work itself. He wants us to be single-minded with him. You know, with the, the Old Testament with him, now in the New Testament with Jesus, which is being single-minded with him. You know, it's a six degrees of separation kind of thing. But to be at work for God, you must be first worked out by God. Another good example would be a loaf of bread. Bread doesn't rise until you warm it and knead it and warm it and knead it and roll it and knead it and roll it and knead it and roll it and punch it and break it and do it. And then it rises up into a nice, fluffy, delicious loaf of bread. This whole thing brings us to the paradox of the Christian life. And that is that the more we give, the more we sacrifice, the more we, we get back. And it doesn't matter what that sacrifice brings to us. Because we know that through Christ, we will be taken care of. You know, the, the old lady who gave her last penny to the temple for her offering. Jesus said she is more blessed than the Pharisee who gave only his 10% out of his excess. Our salvation our saving, our being saved by Christ on the cross through his death and resurrection is the ultimate blessing that we will receive. But we have to work out that salvation, doing what God has called us to do, what God is working in and through us. And that will bring about some sacrifice and some suffering. And when we do that to glorify God and it, does, and it glorifies Him, we can rest in the knowledge and find joy in knowing that that blessing awaits us when Christ returns for the church. That we will have that eternal life with Him in the end. Heavenly Father, we just lift ourselves up to you. We ask that you direct us on where we can sacrifice, where we can put ourselves to bring glory to you, to bring blessings to others, where we can work out that salvation as you work through each one of us and through all of us together. Lord, we just lift ourselves up to you in hopes 
that what we do glorifies you, knowing that we are doing it for you and not for us. We offer ourselves and this prayer in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you all have a wonderful week this week. Enjoy the sunshine and the cool temperatures.